started. And I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Harrison Public Library. And we hope that we can schedule more of these open mic nights, either virtually or definitely in person by late fall, early winter. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight our guests. So I will start off by introducing Rachel Zenhausen. Uh, Rachel is a Harrison native who grew up hiding out in the library. She is a local performer who has appeared in many musicals and plays in the area. Recent appearances include The Adams Family with Bedford Community Theater and working with the Harrison Players. She also serves as an MC for local performing events, including the Harrison Library's Open Mic Nights. Off stage, she works a boring day job, <laughs> but also enjoys horseback riding, cooking, dance, reading, and writing her blogs. And the next introduction, just bear with me for a moment. Is BK Fisher. BK Fisher is the author of Sieve, a novel in verse that is forthcoming in September 2021 from VOA Editions and four previous collections of poetry. Radio Apocrypha from 2018, My Lover's Discourse from 2018, St. Rage's Vault from 2013 and Mutiny Gallery from 2011. Also the author of a critical study, Museum Mediations, Reframing Ekphrasis in Contemporary American Poetry from 2006. She has published poems and reviews in the New York Times, the Paris Review, Kenyon Review, Poetry Northwest, Boston Review, Jacket 2, Field, WSQ, Ninth Letter, Blackbird, Los Angeles Review of Books, Modern Language Studies, and elsewhere. She holds a BA from the John, Johns Hopkins Writing Seminar, an MFA in Poetry from Columbia University, and a PhD in English and American Literature from New York University. A former poetry editor of Boston Review, she teaches the Kama Sutra in the School of the Arts at Columbia University. She lives in Sleepy Hollow, New York with her husband and three children and is currently the Poet Laureate of Westchester County. Please join me in welcoming B.K. Fisher and Rachel Zenhauser. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you. It's so nice to be here. Great. Um, so should I just get started? Yes. All right, perfect. So um, some of the questions I'm going to be asking you tonight are just things that I have thought of, uh, either by reading your work or just musing on the, uh, the world of poetry in general. And some of them are questions I put out there to friends and family to say, uh, what would you want to know about a poet laureate? <laughs> so I'm gonna start with very simple, easy question, which is how does one become the poet laureate of Westchester and what does that job entail? Oh gosh, um, well, <laughs> I'm the, the first poet laureate of Westchester and they, they created the position I think to um, expand their literary programming, Arts Westchester being the, the organization that um, sort of brought this role into being um, in conjunction with the county executive's office. Um, so I sent an application and was was chosen to do this work. I can tell you a little bit about what I I am envisioning for the role. I'd love that. to know that. Because <laughs> I, I, it's kind of been about re, about inventing this particular wheel, and um, it's been fun to kind of explore with Arts Westchester what kind of offerings we can have here. But my intention as poet laureate, or my hope over the two years, is to um, to bring poetry to more people, very simply, and also to amplify the voices of poets um, from around the county, um, all different age groups, backgrounds, and demographics. And we have. We are a suburban place, of course, but we're also, Westchester is also a place with urban communities and rural and woodland spaces. Um, so what I'm doing right now, which I hope people will check out, is a, 
a summer project with Arts Westchester, or Arts Westchester and the Hudson Valley Writers Center called um, the Emergence Poetry Pop-Ups um, to celebrate all of us coming out of our pandemic isolations, actually starting to get outside in the real world and getting out in, in public again. Um, so poets from around the county have been recording themselves reading one poem of theirs standing outside in some favorite spot. Um, you know, recording these with their phones and then they're being gathered on Arts Westchester's YouTube um, channel as a playlist. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited because the series is already showing how much variety there is in poetry in the county. You know, some people are working in a romantic nature tradition. Um, some people have roots in spoken word poetry. Others are influenced by international modernisms. Other poets are writing poems that are very much in a confessional or more narrative tradition. So it's been exciting to see that kind of variety and, and amplify some of those voices. So the, the hashtag is Westchester Poetry. So um, follow that on any of your social media and you can see who pops up. And we also would love to hear from anyone who wants to try to uh, and wants to do one. So it, those who are reading tonight, if you wanna read one of your poems outside somewhere, please send it to me. and and we'll add you to the to the map. So I think they're going to put the links in the chat at some point um, for the the way to find us in this in this project. But I don't know how does one get to be the poet laureate? I, um, does that sort that just tells you what I'm doing? But I don't know. <laughs> well, no, it, it's just interesting because up until now, I didn't know such a thing existed. And uh, from what I understand, you now are the first one. Um, I think you mentioned uh, in our chat the other night that you were you said there were about 20 other applicants? I think so, yeah. So, okay, that's pretty stiff competition. So I'd like to get a little into your, your history. Um, so as, as one of my friends wanted to know, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, at some point, did you suddenly say, I want to be a writer or I want to write poetry? Uh, how, did, how did that evolve in your ambitions? Yeah, you know, I, I'm kind of, it's a boring answer because I'm just kind of a lifer. I mean, I always just wanted to do that. And I, I don't remember not wanting to try to make things with words. Uh, stories and poems kind of simultaneously or in combination, but I've all, uh, even as a young child um, was, was making books, whether, you know, starting, I was interested in making books of poems or stories and starting by stapling them together and then yeah going on to that, that wonderful school paper where there's the lines on the bottom and the blank space for the drawing on top. Oh. So, you know, I have, those are my earliest works from like age five. I'm going um, to ask you, how old were you when you started doing that? So that yeah, was- Yeah, like five. Really young. I, I think that there's a poem that my, I, I, I don't think I wrote it down, but I told it to my mother and she wrote it down, but it was on the occasion of my friend's sixth birthday. And I was, still five. So that was the, the story of the poem is that he was six and I was still five. <laughs> it was very sad. It was a sad poem, but um, that, that's sort of my earliest work as far as I know. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that was actually leading into the question that I was going to ask you, which was, you know, <laughs> and did you write your first poem or do you remember your first poem? Um, and were you sharing that right from the beginning? Like, yeah, I mean, it was an occasional poem on the on the occasion of Chris Warnagiris's sixth birthday. Well, not a lot um, of people Green, want to share Winter it. Green Way in Gambrels, <laughs> Maryland. Yeah, but I then think. I did very, I did go on um, to really pursue school spaces from a pretty young age, where I could learn more about writing and literature and be around other writers. So I did then go on to study writing and literature for a very long time. You know, start as um my bio attests. <laughs> yes, it's very impressive. You know, when you think of uh, teenagers locking themselves in their room writing poetry that never sees the light of day. Um, oh, that's a good, uh, much of mine did not see the light of day. I mean, I, uh, I didn't publish my first book. Maybe it's worth saying after all that schooling, I really, I really studied and got degrees because I wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to be able to teach at a university and, um, to know what I needed to know to do that job. So, but I didn't publish my first book until I was 40. So that's, so there's, you know, in that time I did a lot of teaching and a lot of writing and I taught for eight years at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, um, a group of mostly um, older adults. I 
have since then taught for six years at Columbia. I worked in that in those intervening overlapping years as an editor at Boston Review, which was kind of a 24 seven immersion in um, literary journalism. We that was just um, a kind of whirlwind six year immersion in, in that aspect of what really a deep dive into what's happening in contemporary poetry and kind of being all over the national map with it. Um, and you know, and in that period of time, I also raised a family. So it was there was a gap between my schooling and my book publications, but um, all of it has been training. You know, that's all how I became a poet. So it really sounds like you. It's one of those things, like anything else in life, that you want to be good at. You never stop learning. You never, never stop. stop no. Again. Yeah. So that actually leads me into another question. Um, and I almost find this is funny because it's such a subjective question and um, it always leads me to that one particular scene in the movie Dead Poet Society when they're ripping the books out. But what would you say makes a good poem? Oh gosh, that's an impossible <laughs> question. That's like saying what makes a good song. <laughs> yeah. You know, so and I, I, I'm gonna, so, let, I mean, I guess I, I would say that, yeah, all great poems are going to be very um, intense acts of attention, both for the writer and the reader. But that's probably about as specific as I could get about what makes it good. It's going to have that kind of intensity of focus um, and attention. Um, but poetry as a category of human expression is as broad as the, the word music. So we, we think of poetry as maybe being a more narrow thing, but, it, but it's just as capacious and varied as the category music. So somebody might say to me, I don't really like poetry, but that's kind of like saying, I don't like music. I mean, maybe you don't, but chances are there's probably some kind of music. Well, what your... is lyrics if not uh, their poetry? Right, <laughs> right, and exactly. So um, what makes a poem good is gonna be, a, it's going to depend on what you like too. So I'm going to defer a little bit to that question. Yeah, no, I, I happened to be watching a, a video on, on poetry that um, talked about structure and sound and um, what was the other structure, sound and meaning. Mm -hmm. And is what's the convergence of that? But again, that still reminded me of that scene in Dead Poets Society where they were taking uh ripping the pages out of the books with the elements of what was supposed to be a good poem so oh is that what right oh, okay so that was like the formal formal right. the idea uh, that somebody was trying idea. to formalize what what a good poem was and you had the the teacher who said this is ridiculous that's not what right because but well, that's a very romantic idea that there's this sort of performative passion at the heart of it and when I teach I would what if if this was my classroom, I would probably go right for the fact, I would probably trot out two kind of big words. I would talk about language having both instrumentality and plasticity at the same time. And poetry always sort of operating on those two channels at once. And what I mean by that is uh, language is has both instrumentality and plasticity. So it's gonna both be instrumental, meaning it's gonna, gonna be possible for it to communicate. It's gonna get a point across. It can carry a message. You know, a, a words can be a joke or a promise or a pickup line or a, an apology or many other things, but words can do things. They can have a sort of instrumental function. They mean things, they can have meanings. They can give you directions to the corner store. But at the same time, language, like any other medium of art has plasticity, meaning it's stuffness. It's gonna have sound and um, rhythm and musicality and the shapes of the words and the shapes of the consonants and the clicks, you know, the click of the consonants and the shape of the vowels and all those things. So those two things are always going to be working together in a poem. Um, so that's that's to say that you really can't have. I'm not sure what they were ripping out of the book, but it was. <laughs> I don't. Gonna, I don't and, remember what they were saying. I just remember them ripping the book up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, but the, what that is, is tapping into the spirit of poetry as always countercultural. And I, I, I believe in that in a very real way that um, poetry can engender a kind of collective spirit that is a kind of rage against the machine and a kind of rage against authority and order. And that is an, a, a, one of its <coughs> oldest sort of callings and, you know, um, uh, teleologies and intentions and purposes. You know, I'm, I'm interested in, 
in writing that does break the mold in the sense that it's inclusive, that it brings in writers that are left out of the conversation, you know, that that it is a space where we can hear from people who are historically excluded, for example. Um, you know, people that are writing from a place that's not already sort of privileged by what's in the book. You know, that might be one way to kind of answer that question. Interesting. Um, so I guess one of my next questions and, and there are a whole lot of different parts that offshoot. Um, so this was also a question asked by some of my friends was, uh, where do you get your inspiration from? And I think one of the the questions that to me offshoot when I read your book, Mutiny Gallery, which is um, such a fascinating topic that you would pick, uh, you know, somebody leaving a bad marriage and traveling the country with her son. I mean, that's, that's just an interesting example of, of inspiration. Where, where are you finding their inspiration? Like, how do you even come up with that idea for a book? I mean, I guess I draw on everything. I mean, it's hard. I'm all, I'm a big note taker and I always have a notebook where I keep observations. So, but the observations come from life, from my own experience, from experience of people I know, um, personal experience, but also from things I read or research or experience um, by um, living in a community or living in, um, you know, in, in different communities, you know, and, 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 and finding observations and perceptions, you know, from being on the bus to being reading the newspaper, you know, these are all things that feed into my um, inspiration for writing. And I mentioned that book, one of the um, sort of things that structured it was I had a book of little museums that was given to me. And I had been thinking about this story that the story of Claire, um, the woman who is the protagonist of that book and um, her son, Max, was a kind of spin-off from an earlier poem I had written that was a kind of small narrative um, piece that ended up in St. Rage's Vault. So St. Rage's Vault is actually my first book, but it was published second. So there's a poem called Mothership in there where there's a woman. And I had had, a, a, it was a performance piece and it was a drama. And then I had later thought, well, what happened to her um, after that? So she became the protagonist of that book. The seed of one book became the next. And the little book of little museums fascinated me as a kind of map or template. And I had her as a character that had already been developed visiting these places. And her narrative kind of took its own life. You know, the character had its own, her own integrity. Um, and yeah, there's, there's so much about that book I could ask you a hundred questions about. I mean, the first one being the idea of, um, novel is a poem or poem is a novel yeah. that you're not just writing the strict narrative you're kind of hiding the story a little bit like when you write yeah. a, a novel as a poem you're making readers figure it out and yeah I mean this is a really live question for me as an artist I mean I'm still sort of treading that line my new book that's coming out is also a novel uh, it's really a novella in verse because um my publisher just changed it from novel and verse on the title page to novella. And I'm kind of like, shoo, that's actually much more accurate um, because it's not long, you know, it's not 300 pages. It's a, it's a short story. But I've, I've, what I've been interested in is how to put the lyric, you know, the lyric poem to the service of story, not to write one long epic poem. That's one way to do narrative and poetry, you know, the Odyssey and many others, book length narrative poems, but to write lyric poetry, but then to, sequence them. And part of it, I think, was really just born out of my interest in that was just born pragmatically out of the kind of circumstances and conditions under which I was writing, that I was distracted constantly, am distracted constantly in my life as a parent and in my all my many roles. And having a thread of a story was helpful to me yeah. as I was composing. So I could just pick up the next museum and write that piece of the story rather than having to start over every time. And I think that's another thing that struck me about the book was that it wasn't one long continuous poem that you broke up each museum as a different chapter, but that you didn't stick to a same style. Um, no. Some were written with a really certain form, um, you know, more stanza-like, while some almost seem more like a stream of consciousness. Um, what lent that uh, 
to you? I mean, uh, did that just sort of happen naturally or did you say to yourself, oh, this, I, I wanna switch it up a bit. So I'm gonna change my, my format each time I, I write a different chapter or is it just, um, oh, this just lends itself more to a stream of consciousness and this one lends itself more to a specific meter. Um, so how did you come about those choices? That's a good question. And the Mutiny Gallery, I, I think it was definitely a matter of just what that museum inspiration gave me on the page. And I worked inductively to see like, how did this material lend itself? You know, so it was uh, a museum, I, I'm trying to think of one, um, some of the museums gave me quite a list of items. So it became a catalog poem because I wanted to use all these juicy details. <laughs> Other museums kind of suggested um, a narrative moment and I wanted to just be able to tell it. So I used a different form. But in, in like in my book, Radio Apocrypha, I felt I was more consciously working in two forms and alternating them. So I kind of found that I had one voice that seemed to lend itself pretty uh, well to uh, lineated poems that were kind of narrative. And then I had prose poems in between that were more um, disjunctive, but in the voice of a different character. Like, so I would alternate them and that kind of held together in a different way, maybe, maybe better, maybe more predictably. Um, so I was kind of figuring it out as I went along. So, we'll see. The new book <laughs> also alternates. It has prose poems and very, um, almost aphoristic lyrics in between, like really tight lyrics and then prose poems that are very narrative, so. Interesting. I got, I definitely got to read some more. I, I think uh, the one I got happened to be the one that was most easily accessible from Amazon. Um, but I, I think the one that you have upcoming is, uh, I have it in my, uh, my saved list. It's ready, ready, to, ready to come when I can get it. Um, so that kind of leads me to a question that um, may be a little difficult for you to answer, maybe easy for you to answer, but considering um, the different ways that you have approached writing your poems within your books and also the fact that you take so much inspiration from everything, how would you describe your style? Now, I mean, from a broader perspective, you could say your style is, is meant to be written versus um, spoken word, um, but I'm sure you could probably uh, take it into more depth than that. You know, I, I'm going to, I mean, this is a total cop out. I'm going to say eclectic. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> no, but I, I do I'm really um, want, I like my work to be mixed and I do it really, I, I think I like all, all the art forms that I do, I enjoy are very mixed forms. I like my visual art that way too like to be very collagey and full of um, uh, multiple textures. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I would describe my work as, um, as eclectic in what it includes, very um, throwing out a pretty wide net for what it includes, whether it code switches a lot. There's a lot of, maybe goes from high lyric to the vernacular, you know, I kind of want, um, you know, I want pop culture and I want Rembrandt and I want it all in the mix. But I, I think that has it, my, my, my beliefs about language or my understanding of language is as a mutational thing. And I want the language to, to my poetry to capture that language is mutational, that it evolves, you know, language is an ecosystem. It's a very varied and um, busy and noisy and complex and, complicated ecosystem. And that's what makes poetry possible, that language is mutational in that way, that meanings of words are never static, that they evolve, that they're dynamic, they're relational, they're adaptive, um, and that you're going to find new forms because language is that. It just does that. That's just the way it works. And mixedness in art is always generative the way that um, in biology, hybridity is health. And I say this a lot in the classroom and whenever I give a reading too, that um, I think that's true in art as well, that hybridity is health. You know, that there's, it's not purity or uh, a sort of monochrome, but a kind of um, really polyvocal or polyglossic aesthetic. So I think eclectic and polyglossic might be the short answer. <laughs> no. Somebody asked how I balanced motherhood and writing. And I'm like, ha, 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 I don't even know. I have no <laughs> idea. 
I had to pay my kid to keep the dog out of here right now because I was just <laughs> completely out of any other options. I gave my 15 year old $7 to keep the dog out of here. That's what I had in my wallet. So I don't know. <laughs> How did anybody like, know? Stay out with the dog. Here, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, this was another one that uh, I got from my friends when, when I threw it out to them. Um, and I think it's a good one to sum everything up. So what would you most want people to know about you? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> I don't even Oh, I don't know. Can I just read my poems now? <laughs> I have no idea. It's middle of July. I, that, that's an impossible question. <laughs> uh, what do I want people to know about me? Let's just read the poems. I, I'll answer that if I think of anything meaningful. Okay. Um, I'm a Sagittarius and it explains kind of everything. Just <laughs> keep that in mind. There you have it. Just like, just remember that. And anytime you, that was what people should know. Fair enough. I, look, that's a good enough answer as any, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, but before you read, I would like to see if anybody else has a question. Um, oh dear, who is in this room? Okay. Throw it out to the chat box. Oh God, this has been fun. <laughs> Great, all right. Um, how about we just uh, let you go and do your thing? All right, yeah, I have a really short little set I would do and then I would like I'm looking forward to hearing others read and please um if you ha I know I'm Barbara Bloom and um who else is reading and uh Gabby is reading is that right Darby Darby, Darby is reading yes okay not Gabby I see I, whoever is Gabby on my screen is now like having a total <laughs> panic but no you don't have to. <laughs> Darby Darby's <laughs> right next to Rachel there you so. are okay you're <laughs> hidden Okay, so I really want to hear your poems. Please don't be shy. And I would love to hear everyone who wants to read one. And we have to read the Ellen Montgomery poem too. Okay. So whenever right. you're I'm ready. Gonna read. I, thought I'd, um, I thought I'd just read a few summer poems. So um, I'll start um, with the poem. I have a poem called Maternity Bathing Suit and it's from St. Rage's Vault, which is my first book that was published second. So, um, but this is called maternity bathing suit. And I promised on the internet, I would read this. And if I say it on the internet, it's definitely true. And I, I, I stick yeah. to it. Um, I think I'm still the only person in history who's ever written a poem by this title, so, maternity bathing suit. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Maybe somebody else will. Forget those gilded mamas. She's a magic marker Venus de Milo at the open swim. A cellulite bird of blub and doodles full of words, A-E-I-O-U and growing. A varicose cosmos of panty hoseless possibility up to her anatomy in irregular stars. Her daisy decal polka dot pliant bingo bottom buoyant enough to balance an elephantine arabesque off the ladder. Smile at Mr. Smug One, shrunk in his trunks in front of her flagrant magenta belly full of flutter kicks. Oh, shaky bravura and drop splashless into water over her head. Oh, how cute. Yes, maternity bathing suit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, next, what I thought I would do um, is read one longish poem about swimming, swimming in the Hudson River. Um, where I, I'm just a, a few hundred yards from right here um, in Sleepy Hollow, New York, on the shores of the Hudson. Um, it's a poem um, that's in three vo uh, voices, the three graces. It's told uh, the three graces, Talia, Aglaia, and Euphrosyne, um, the three graces as swimming instructors. Um, but I'll just read through as all three voices as one. I think it will make um, pretty good sense that way without distinguishing them. It's a kind of choral poem about learning to swim in open water um, and trying to swim across the Hudson, which was an obsession of mine for a number of years. Um, and the presence of the Hudson being magnificent in our landscape and in our, our lives here in Westchester. Well, I thought I'd read this. This is a little, it goes on a little ways. And then I'm just gonna end with one more. 
So this is River Graces at the Moorings. Mooring. When you are ready, wade in. Expect a jolt, a shudder when your body immerses, when you transpose from land to water creature, which you once were. Glide, rudder, blur. There is heat in your veins, but your heart is still weak. Leave the cove. Every few strokes, pick up your head to spot a point on land, a bulkhead, a flagpole, an outcropping of trees. Sight is a verb, a rhythmic motion. Sight. Vastness comes on fast. You are a fleck under that sky, a white swim cap, a white cap. Some days there is chop, rough currents that pull with or against the wind or wind from the north and a strong north pulling tide. Keep your head down. Your forward motion will make a pocket of air slip through the swells. Mahican Mahikanatuk, the river that flows two ways, effluvial and tidal and both at once. No more or less complicated than your heart with its systole and diastole, its loyalty and wanderlust, almost an estuary, almost a sea change. You will come to know the river as you know a house, as you know a body, a medium to move through, a medium that moves you. You will start to know that you don't know what to do, river that flows two ways. The river is a room with walls and roof unfolded, fallen open, four forces, current, tide, gravity, wind, squall, source, wilt. Some days it is dirty, the swallows a swill of wood chips and seaweed, the women still swim. They emerge with brown beards, wiping their mouths and chins with the backs of their hands. The women worry about PCBs and pesticides and dredging and sewer mains, about Albany and industry, but they are getting in, joking about their limbs fluorescing in their beds, swimming in their sleep, never reaching the point. On a day when it is too rough to swim, when the cumulus kicks up a gale, stand barefoot on the moorings and read the river surface. Gunmetal, ochre, sea glass, spruce. Watch all of it go wan as if the color were let out a drain in the bottom. Stand on algae planks where the paint wears thin, where the marsh tide wets the edges with detritus. The river stretches a tin roof over the lone room of the world. Some days the current will work against you, reach, turn your body through its full length, a long spring of power with every half turn, every core motion, core tide, counter tide, phrase, breach, royal, have the sense to stay down under the churning. There's barely a breath's worth of air, but you'll find it, find the fistful of air. You know in your cold bones that none of it is a metaphor for anything. Soon, sooner than you think, the river will be under ice flows again. You will wait in an ice house for the wind to die down. The river will keep flowing, but flats of ice will collect in the coves. And you will stand in the ice house and watch the surface drift apart. The ice house is above you, around you, rhombus rise over run, gunnel and domicile, trapezoid, trapdoor. You are waiting to see what you are going to do. The roof floats off so the crevice of air is a door. Floor is ceiling, is roof, is wall. The river doesn't care what you decide. A breast, a sunder, a wash. This is buoyancy. Bob and crest, reach and glide and glide. If you tire, Turn over on your back, take a long breath to rise. Mire, elide, surmise. This is the river's rhythm. Parallels, striations, arrays, extension, and crux. This is drift, ubiquity, ballast. The river cleans itself twice a day with the tide, belied. The river cannot clean itself any faster when it is poisoned, it has to wait for the moon. When you go home and wring out your confusion, it is not river water in the basin, it is confusion. You want to swim across, to cover the whole distance, to leave one bank and arrive on the other, look back and see the river anew. You want to be new, resist, 
strive, askew. It is the same river. You can choose not to breathe for longer than you thought, but breathe. It's a long way across. You try to carry words in your head, verse and stroke, verse by stroke, but you can't hold the words, can't hold the thought. You return to water and breath, breath and mouth, water and mouth. It is a long way from bank to bank across the deep channel. Tarry, fraught, blank. The current is strong in the deep channel, some fathoms deep. Fear is a medium just as the water is a medium, translucent, olive, cool. It is brine in the back of the throat, a brackish pond. Fear is a medium of immersion, perfusion, but it is outside yourself. You can swim through it. Unspool, supine, confusion. Go on, swim across. Go on, swim across the deep channel, some fathoms deep. River is river, fear is fear. Water and mouth, breath and mouth, water and breath. Bravo. And that's from my book, My Lover's Discourse. That. And um, never read that by myself. I've, I've read that with friends, like in, as a trio. But that was interesting. Oh. And I'll just, um, I'll finish up with one last poem that's from my new book, which as, as Giovanna mentioned, is coming out in September with BOA editions. And the book is called Sieve, uh, C-E-I-V-E. -E. Um, the title is the root word that gives us the words perceive, conceive, deceive. Um, receive and many others. So it's the root um, that means catch or get. Um, the book is a retelling of the Noah's Ark story on a container ship in the near future. Um, so a catastrophic collapse of civilization has prompted a group to escape um, from this area um, on a freighter that's bound for Greenland, which after global warming is now the new North Carolina. So it's um, a container ship and the woman's name is Val and she's found in the wreckage of her flooding house by um, the UPS man whose name is Roy. All right, that's the story. I hope you'll check out the story because this little piece doesn't tell much of it. I'm just gonna give you one lyric bit. And in this little um, poem, Val is sort of waiting out this long journey where there's nothing to do except watch the, the surface of the sea. C says, alley-oop, C is a poor performance with a squeegee. C is a screen showing track and field footage. C collects all kinds of clippings, toenail, magazine, grass. C keeps sanctity in aluminum cans. C is rain, a whole lot of it. C regresses to gray again. C is a piece of linoleum with cuts where a knife was dropped. C says persuasive, squander, sway. C is a nylon shower curtain to catch drips and debris. C shows a fecal smear. C is mica, masonite, wet cardboard wadded up. C survives all its gunshot wounds. C is a quilt, dingy from a body's oils from dragging the hem. C is a hung jury, a salter, a heckler, a crone. C swears someone tracked the mud in. C stutters, tells it like it is. So thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Yes. Thank you. That's wonderful. Just wonderful. So Barbara, you're up next. Can I spotlight you? Well, I don't know what that means, but. <laughs> Uh, so we can all see you. I'm going to oh. switch the spotlight to you since you have the mic, correct? No. Okay. And this is Barbara Bloom, one of our longtime Harrison Library patrons. Yes. Um, thank you, Giovanna, and thank you, Barbara. I wa just want to say to Barbara um, that I remember the first time I met you and it was at the Newberger Museum. Oh! Uh, 
Um, are you there, Barbara? Okay, yeah, there you are. Um, and we were doing acrostic poetry, which I never heard of before, but this was like many years ago. Do you remember? Yes, Just I'm so excited that I loved doing those. I loved those classes. Yeah, so, um, and um, so I remember meeting you for the first time and I wrote a poem at the, at the museum. Um, um about one of the paintings there nice. um, i also have your signature on a certificate that i have for my poem um entitled god's child which i will read tonight um and it's uh published in the anthology of um let the poet speak okay yes yeah, so um, on my certificate as a finalist in that poetry contest from yeah. the Greenberg. From the yeah. Greenberg Library. That's uh, awesome. With Brenda Connor Bay. We all miss oh, her. Yes, yes, dear Brenda. Oh, dear Brenda. Yeah, dear Brenda. Um, so, um, you know, you've come across in many, many of my travels, whether it be your name or the memory of you um, and I'm so happy. I'm very happy to see that Giovanna has engaged you in this. And so, um, and also I'm a member of the Poetry Caravan where I've done a lot of readings at um, uh, Wheel Cornell, uh, mm -hmm. the psychiatric hospital in Westchester. So you must know, um, you must know Ruth Handel, the another magnificent being. Right, right, right. So anyway, enough of that. Okay, I'll move on. And the first poem I'm going to read is um, entitled God's Child. Black, white, other. She only knew her mother. Her father died when she was six and her mother was left to explain the mix. Racial boundaries broken in two made her wonder what to do. Who is she? The questions reframe. She's God's child, black, white, and other. Okay. The second poem I'm going to read, um, I wrote back in the 90s, and the original poem was entitled Change. This poem is entitled Change Two, and it's apropos to its title, the beauty of the poem is that it keeps changing. Uh, and sometimes I'm not quick enough to keep up with all the changes of the times. Uh, but this poem, even though I wrote it in the 1990s, you'll see still resonates today. Change two. Small change, big change. I've seen it all change. Change in your pocket, change like a rocket. I say, change, don't knock it. Change of time, change of rhyme, change of beat, walk with fast feet. Change of fads, answer personal ads, change of dates, lock in rates, take a chance, refinance, change of taxes, everything's faxes, VCRs, phones in cars, commuters with computers, change of home, kids left alone, use beepers and cell phones. We're upwardly mobile and everything's global. We can't be planted and we take family for granted. Bridge the gap, parents, teens, and rap. Forget about wealth, change for your health. Change of pace, what's the race? Human race, black and white, what a plight. Let's not fight. Remember your roots and dance in your own boots. Change of mind, let's all be kind. Change of heart, be politically smart. Change of life, pray for less strife. 
change to make you smile, change to beguile, hard change, easy change, slow change. What a range, this change. Be the change you want to see, a better world for you and me. I say change yourself, at least for a while. Change yourself to make our world smile. Change. You can count on it. Okay. That was great. Um, I have one that I didn't edit. I'd like to recite it, but it's never seen the light of day and it's a little rough. But if you will indulge me, it'll only take, I think, 30 seconds. I'm not sure. Sure, sure. Go for it. Um, so this is, I wrote this just before the pandemic. It's called Give a Damn. I can't help it if I give a damn about my neighborhood look, about how my neighborhood looks, about the home I live in and the laws of the land. You can taunt me, call me a witch when I bitch about things I give a damn about, but know this, when I make a complaint, it's because I give a damn. When I make a suggestion, it's because it's for my future as well as yours. It's for growth, it's for health and quality of life. Not only for me, but for you too, my neighbor, my friend, even my enemy. You'll benefit too. You can mock me, laugh at me, criticize me, and curse me. But whatever I do, I do for the betterment of not only me, but for you too. Because I give a damn. That's it. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Very nice. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank Both you. of them. Really lovely. I'm going to turn the spotlight <laughs> as to... I even heard the comfy chair. <laughs> Darby <laughs> Callahan. <laughs> Another right. long time. Some, no qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> So bear with right. just jot down things and go to my mind. Um, and there's I I plan to read two poems. Um, and the first one is my summer poem called Start with a Cowboys. Um it's about where we vacation in the summer. Um, okay. <laughs> Saltwater cowboys, they beckon me homeward, out through the woodlands and over the sand. On through the water and into the thickets, rotting the journey through the beautiful land. Why can't it be July? Sweet summer at Roundup, when magic approaches and hearts are aflame. When I see now the ponies emerge from the mist with whinnies and knickers when rustling their manes. The cowboys call out, get on there, you ponies, the fillies and stallions the old and the young, each life is so precious, each one a reminder of why we are present and why we have come. The sun is just rising, so bold and so brilliant. The ocean before us waves crashing the shore. My heart is quite certain there's nowhere else like this. Being here always leaves me wanting for more. Hey. That's it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and this is just something I wrote recently um, called Musings. What if one day I wake up feeling unfettered instead of unloved, that the touch I crave might be my own, not feeling the weight, the shame of things undone, but the mantle of tasks accomplished. To remember a day brightened, not every mistake. To recall an adventure, not a fear. To embrace forgiveness, abandon judgment, 
viewing the contours of my face, not as punishment for years lived, rather as reward to see beauty entire and not countless imperfection. Nice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's beautiful, beautiful, Darby. Yes, very nice. I enjoyed that. Amazing. <laughs> Now the floor is open if anyone would like to recite a poem. And yeah, you, Abby, you must have something. Oh, Abby, what's your Abby? <laughs> this is a little one. It's like a haiku. It's um, for Scythia, wherever I may find her blooming. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's kind of dull. <laughs> oh, I no, love that. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I have, I cheated. I don't have any original poems, <laughs> but I have summer related poems and I will read one. Okay. Or two. We'll see. And then if anyone else would like to read by all means, um, The first one is called The Summer Day by Lucy Maud Montgomery, who many of you probably know. Uh, she wrote under the name L.M. Montgomery, Canadian author who wrote Anna Green Gables, which is a beloved series for a number of readers. And her poem is A Summer Day. The dawn laughs out on Orient Hills and dances with the diamond rills. The ambrosial wind but faintly stirs the silken beaded gossamers. In the wide valleys, lone and far, lyrics are piped from limpid air. And far above, the pine trees free voice ancient lore of sky and sea. Come, let us fill our hearts straight away with hope and courage of the day. Noon. Hiving sweets of sun and flower has fallen on dreams in wayside bower where bees hold honeyed fellowship with the ripe blossom of her lip. All silent are her poppied veils and all her long Arcadian dales where idleness is gathered up, a magic draught in summer's cup. Come, let us give ourselves to dreams by lisping margins of her streams. Adown the golden sunset way, the evening comes in wimpled gray. By burnished shore and silver lake, cool winds of ministration wake. O'er out accidental meadows far, there shines the light of moon and star. And sweet, low tinkling music rings about the lips of haunted springs, in quieted, of earth and air, tis meet we yield our souls to prayer. And that's Lucy Maud Montgomery. And Something in a Summer's Day, which is by Emily Dickinson, which I think most people are familiar with her and her poetry, little known during her life, but uh, well known posthumously, who lived in the 19th century mostly as a recluse, but uh, poetry lives on. And this is called Something in a Summer's Day. A something in a summer's day, as slow her flambeau burn away, which solemnizes me. A something in a summer's noon, a depth, an azure, a perfume, transcending ecstasy, and still within a summer's night, a something so transporting bright, I clap my hands to see, then veil my too inspecting face. Let such a subtle shimmering grace flutter too far from me. The wizard fingers never rest, the purple brook within the breast, still shapes its narrow bed, still rears the east her amber flag. Guides still the sun along the crag, his caravan of red, so looking on the night, the morn, conclude the wonder gay, and I meet 
coming through the dews and their summer and her summer's day. Emily Dickinson. And the last one I have is by Spike Mulligan, who's an Irish British actor and comedian, also a writer and musician. And this is a light poem called Summer Dawn. My sleeping children are still flying dreams in their goose down heads. The lush of the river singing morning songs. Fish watch their ceilings turn sun white. The gray green pike lances upstream. Kale like mermaid's hair points the water's drift. All is morning hush and bird beautiful. If only I didn't have flu. And that's Spike Mulligan. And that's my contribution <laughs> for the evening. <laughs> well read. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, some classics, right? So. <laughs> they're always good. <laughs> they're always good, right? So. The floor is still open if anyone else would like to, to read a poem and no pressure. We're, we're so delighted that everyone was able to join us tonight. And oh, and Akiko has written something in the chat. Oh, her microphone's not working. Um, she writes and I'll read it out loud for everyone. My impressive poem is that I have heard the blackbird pipe his note, the thrush and linnet too but there is none of them can sing so sweet, my singing bird as you, by Orphan Train. Until now, I've never read English poems. Today, all of you gave me many magnificent world of poem. I really appreciate it. From today, I would like to enjoy reading poetry. Mm -hmm. Well, our mission is accomplished then. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Akiko. Akiko, uh, let me spotlight you, Akiko is um, in Japan. So thank you so much for joining us, Akiko. And that was beautiful. And I hope that you start writing your own poetry in whatever, whichever language speaks to you. Okay. Well. Thank you, Akiko. Thank you, Akiko. Nice to have you from far away. <laughs> yes, from very far away. Back in the morning. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So yeah. before we conclude for tonight, does anyone else want to read? I'm, I'm sorry, I have a few spotlights on, so <laughs> I'll dim them out. Uh, before we go, I just wanna put in the chat again, the link that uh, Barbara mentioned for the Arts Westchester playlist. And there's also a link to the map for the project, which is in the chat. Yes, uh, please then record a video if you want, and I will put it on. I will make you a star. Oh, mm -hmm. maybe we could do one with the library. Yeah, that, if you, I would love be... to have one from Harrison. I, I, if you look at the map, we have pins um, across this beautiful landmass that we have here. Oh, so beautiful we can map. we can start working on that. That would be awesome. So I can use some more people. Um, things are clustering a little too Hudson River because no. of. Um, I will be willing to do that, but I will need someone to do the video. I'm not, uh, okay. I don't know how to do that, but I would, I would love to, you know, um, participate in the, um, uh, the Arts Westchester. I used to be a member of the Arts Westchester. Maybe um, there's somewhere outside by the library that you like. You were talking about yeah, the spaces that you have there. That would be amazing. That, yeah, it would be wonderful to have Harrison Library in the in the background. We just um, I was just in Yonkers at a a school and we videoed a kid out front the front of the school. It was really fun. But I would like to spotlight some other places besides just the woods. A lot of people just went into the woods, but it would be nice to have something by a library as well. Well, I would do it in front of the Harrison Library. Yeah. In the room. We'll make it happen, Barbara. All right. I'm counting on it. <laughs> I want to. I need a director. That's Here's the library reader. Garden. We'll arrange it. No worries. All right. We have. There's no. What's the deadline on us? On well, the, we're um, we're publishing them through this up until Labor Day, but the sooner the better. You know, if okay. I have, a, I need to kind of have a couple weeks lead time. They caption them. They make them accessible for for uh, closed captioning and everything else. So we need oh, a couple no. of weeks. 
Okay. Will, there be, will there be a theme? No, or... it's any theme you want. Okay. The, 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 so anything you want, it doesn't have to speak to the place per se. It can be about something related or unrelated. Mm -hmm. um, it can be about emerging or not. It can be mm -hmm. um, anything. People have done a variety of things. So you could check it out. There's a, we've a published, I think 10 already and um, there's more to come. Okay, so uh, okay. Barbara will be in touch and anyone else who would like to participate will make it happen.